Rachel Barber was born on the 12th of September 1983. She was the eldest daughter of Elizabeth and Michael Barber and had two younger sisters, Heather and Ashley Rose. The Barber couple are from Glen Waverley, a small town in the interior of the state of Victoria, Australia, but in 1998, when Rachel was 14, they moved to Bayswater North. Wherever the family went, Rachel was known for her beauty. She had a flawless skin, striking green eyes, and a body and posture of a ballerina. Despite her being very shy, she loved to dance and had an incredible talent for dancing, but she didn't have the same talent for studying. Her parents had difficulty keeping her interest in school to the point that a year earlier, at the age of 13, they had already authorized Rachel to leave high school and join a full-time dance school, the Dance Factory Academy, which was in Richmond, more towards the center of Melbourne. It was important to them that their daughters really focus on the talent that came from within each of them and Rachel's passion was really dance. At the Dance Factory Academy, Rachel met Emmanuel Carella, who was called Money by Everyone. The two were the same age and began dating with the barber's approval. In the late afternoon, on the 28th of February 1999, a Sunday, Elizabeth realized that her daughter had been talking to someone on the phone for a long time, but because she was a teenager, she thought it was normal and it would probably be money on the other end of the line. The next morning, March 1st, as usual, Michael dropped Rachel off at the train station so she could catch the 9.30 a.m. train to the Dance Academy. From time to time before a class started, Rachel would have a breakfast at the house of a dance partner named Carly, who lived very close to the academy, and that Monday, that's what she did. But, on that particular day, Rachel said she was looking forward to a job she was about to do that evening. Carly asked what kind of job, but Rachel answered she couldn't say until it's done, but this job was organized by a friend of hers. Apart from this job, she was very excited with the possibility to earn some money to buy the new pair of Spice Girls shoes, and this is an important piece of information to be given now, because soon it will become a clue in this case. Later, at dance school, she also commented the same thing to Manny. He felt that the situation was a little bit weird, but because she said it was organized by a friend, he felt less worried, but not before he asked her to call him once this job was done, and she agreed. Early in the evening, Michael was waiting for Rachel at the train station at the usual time of 6.15 p.m. The train arrived, but Rachel wasn't on it. Something strange because Rachel was very punctual, but he thought that maybe she had been distracted or something like that, missed the train, and that she would come on the next one. He sat and waited. When the next train arrived, no sign of Rachel. At that time, cell phones were not as accessible as they are today, and Rachel didn't have one, so Michael started to get more and more worried as he couldn't contact his daughter. The third train arrived at 7.40 p.m. and once again, Rachel wasn't on it. He decided to call his wife Elizabeth, who panicked and after called Manny. He explained that probably her job hadn't finished yet and it terrified Elizabeth because she didn't know anything about it. She started calling all her daughter's friends, but they didn't have any information about her or at least about this job. Elizabeth, Michael and Manny later began to piece together how Rachel's day had panned out. 
According to the information they had gathered, she would have gotten on the train at 9.30 a.m., had breakfast with Carly at her house, and gone to the dance academy. She was last seen by her colleagues at 5.45 p.m., walking towards Bridge Road. Elizabeth and Michael had no idea what their daughter was planning or with whom, so about 8 p.m., they decided to go to the police and reported the teenager missing. The police did not treat the occurrence as a missing person report as it had been less than three hours since she was last seen. They instructed the couple to stay at home because Rachel would probably be out with other friends or, who knows, another boyfriend. If she didn't show up after 24 hours, they could return. So, the barbers went home, but they couldn't even sleep. When looking for clues of what could have happened, Elizabeth noticed that Rachel had taken her favorite teddy bear and a piece of clothing with her. Michael even put a chair outside, on the sidewalk, because inside the house he found it difficult to breathe with so much concern for his daughter. That was a very long night for the barbers. The next morning, March 2nd, Rachel didn't show up for breakfast at Carly's house and she also didn't show up for dance classes. Michael decided to go to the police station and tell them that there was no way it could be a runaway because the daughter was afraid of the dark, afraid of walking alone in the street, she was shy, and none of her friends or her boyfriend seemed to know where she was. After so much insistence, he managed to file a police report that same morning. However, when Elizabeth returned to the police station at 2 p.m. to give a current photo of her daughter, she learned that they had lost the police report which was still on paper and not typed into the system. She had to answer everything again, that means from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. no one had done anything. Discredited by the local police, Elizabeth and Michael decided to start their own investigation. They began by retracing the route their daughter would have taken that day on foot. Everywhere they went, they showed a picture of Rachel asking if anyone had seen her. The two spent the afternoon in the middle of the city crowd, desperate, looking for their daughter. They no longer knew if the path they were taking was the right one until they arrived at a shoe store. The seller said she saw that girl two days before that day asking for a Spice Girl's pair of shoes. Rachel was very happy and asked the seller to keep it for two days until she would get money from a job and then she would be back to buy it. But it never happened. That was the first clue. Hours later, Manny was talking to the barbers and brought more information. Even Rachel hadn't said the friend's name. She told him this friend was older than her. This was the second clue. On the 3rd of March, the police received a call from the director of the dance school saying that they had opened Rachel's locker and found her wallet, money and several documents there. That means Rachel was somewhere with no money or ID. So, a team of investigators was sent to the barber's home where they interviewed the family and collect objects from Rachel's room. Even with the police now involved, family and friends also distributed posters with the girl's photo and information throughout the region. On Monday, 8th of March, a week after the disappearance, the Missing Persons Division took over the case and began interviewing family, friends and teachers. 
It was then that the investigation team psychologists asked Elizabeth to describe Rachel's routine and the last things she had seen her do the day before her disappearance. Elizabeth explained everything in detail and recalled the lengthy call Rachel made on the afternoon to Manny. But when the police checked this information with Manny's interview, they realized that the two had not spoken by phone that day. The police decided to request a call report from the telephone company. That was 1999, and that kind of data wasn't as readily available as it is today. The report arrived a few days later, and they discovered that Rachel had received two calls on her home phone on Sunday afternoon one at 5.24 p.m., lasting 15 minutes, and the second one at 5.45 p.m., lasting 30 minutes. Both came from another landline in a location 40 minutes from the barber's home, almost in the center of Melbourne and close to the dance academy. The phone number was registered to Caroline Robertson. When police officers asked if the barbers knew that name, they said no. The only Caroline they knew was called Caroline Reed, who was an old neighbor, a little older than Rachel, but they hadn't seen her in a long time. Upon further investigation, the police discovered that the two Carolines were the same person. Her full name, Caroline Reed. Robertson. In the following days, the police tried to find Caroline, but without success. At work, her boss said she was sick, hadn't been working for a few days, and probably she would be at home. They got the address and went to her apartment. Once there, they knocked at the door, but nobody answered. They got permission from her father to enter, but the door was locked with an internal latch. The police needed the help of the fire department to get in through the bathroom window as the apartment was on the third floor. Upon entering, they saw that part of the apartment was overturned and partly boxed up as if she was organizing a move. They also found Caroline on the floor next to a bottle of epilepsy medication. While help was being provided, the police searched the apartment and found a notebook with several disturbing notes, one of them was referring to Rachel. Caroline was taken to the emergency room, but within hours she was released and taken to the police station. There, she admitted to murdering Rachel and burying her in her father's farm. The investigator asked if the girls had some fight or if Rachel had betrayed Caroline's trust in something, but she said no. What would be the reason then? She didn't answer. While Caroline was being interrogated, a team of investigators with sniffer dogs searched her apartment. The dogs alerted them to the closet in one of the rooms, indicating that a corpse would have been there recently, and it was through the items collected in the apartment that the police were able to extract a little information and assemble a reconstruction. Caroline Robertson met Rachel's family in 1994 when they were neighbors in Mount Albert before they moved to Baywater North. Caroline, who was 14 at the time, asked to look after the barber's daughters, Rachel, 10, Rather, 6, and Ashley Rose, still a baby. Caroline's younger sisters were the same age of Rachel's sisters, and the families visited each other's frequently. In 1998, when the barbers moved, the contact between the families decreased considerably. Caroline, however, seemed not to be satisfied with the distance. Notes found in Caroline's notebooks 
showed that she had had an obsession with Rachel for a considerable amount of time. She made all sorts of notes about the girl, from details taken from the baby album to shots of her growth, first words, first doctor's appointments, etc. She possibly had access to the family book that kept this information and copied all the data regarding Rachel. Her notes also showed tables of comparisons between the two with positive attributions to Rachel and extremely negative attributions about herself. For example, Rachel had a perfect skin and she had lots of pimples. Rachel had a perfect body and she thought she was fat, awkward and ridiculous. The criticisms that Caroline made of herself in her notes showed a feeling of extremely low self-esteem mixed with an exaggerated hatred for herself. At the age of 18, she went to live alone in an apartment in Melbourne and it was when her obsession with Rachel took on even greater proportions. Caroline planned to steal Rachel's identity and this plan was written down detail by detail in her notes. Was this evidence along with more information later collected, that the prosecution created a diversion of what happened from the day that Rachel disappeared until the day that Caroline was arrested. On the evening of Sunday, 28th of February, Caroline called Rachel and invited her to participate in what she pretended to be a test, a kind of survey like the ones people get paid to answer. She had already invited Rachel to participate in a fake beauty contest just to attract her to her home, but Elizabeth had not let her go because she thought her daughter was still too young for this type of work. However, this time Caroline told Rachel that it was a secret research project that no one could find out about not even her parents. As part of the research, she asked Rachel to pack a backpack with the things she most like. The following day, 1st of March, Caroline missed work with the excuse of being sick and arranged to meet Rachel at the train station near the dance academy. The two went to Caroline's apartment where the supposed test would take place. On the way, they bought pizza. In the apartment, while Rachel waited in the living room, Caroline added powdered antihistamines to the girl's slice of pizza. She had also bought two bottles of wine, but Rachel refused to drink alcohol. In conversing with one of the prison psychologists, Caroline confessed to having started a kind of relaxation meditation after the pizza Rachel was used to this practice as she had already done these meditations at the dance academy. She sat in the lotus position where her legs were bent and crossed with a straight spine and closed eyes. Then Caroline asked Rachel to think of peaceful things and moments that made her life happy. With Rachel sitting there thinking about the good things, Caroline got up very slowly, went behind the girl, and strangled her with a telephone cable. She claimed to not remember what she did next. On the second and third, she would have stayed at home with the girl's body kept in her wardrobe. On the fourth, she hired a moving company and asked them to transport a sculpture to her father's farm. She then wrapped Rachel's body in several rugs and placed it in a huge suitcase which the moving company took without suspecting. Caroline arrived to her father's farm minutes later and buried the body. On the 5th, Caroline returned to work and her co-works reported that she was pale and rather quiet. On this day, the police were already calling several people looking for Rachel, Richard Caroline's work. She explained to the people at work that the missing girl in the city flyers 
was a girl she used to babysit and that the police wanted her help. She even added that Rachel was troublesome and always ran away from home. On the 7th, Caroline even called the barber's home and spoke with Rachel's uncle, saying that she was available to help if they needed. On the 10th, she visited a branch of the Bank of Melbourne and asked for a personal loan, claiming it was for a purchase of a car. While the bank was waiting for approval, Caroline came back home but called them three times in the same day, asking if it was already approved. Taking into account that she didn't have a driver's license, the prosecution concluded that this money would be used for a possible escape. On the 11th and 12th, Caroline called the office where she worked and said she could not work because she was sick, when in fact she was in her apartment packing up her belongings. And it was on the afternoon of 12th, as she was preparing to flee, that the police knocked on her door. On the 13th, Rachel's body was found in an advanced state of decomposition and with a telephone cable still wrapped around her neck. In jail, Caroline was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, which Judge Frank Vincent believes contributed to her conduct. The judge also took into account psychiatric and medical reports alleging that Caroline would have grown up in an environment full of challenges. Her mother was bipolar and from a very early age she had received a lot of criticism, punishment and emotional abuse from her parents, treatments that contributed to her developing a bad version of herself. She would have failed to see her own qualities, such as her academic performance and her determination at work, considering only the life of a third person in which she imagined herself to be perfect. However, the judge added that despite these challenges, he found the malevolence with which Caroline acted very disturbing. She was jailed for nearly two years awaiting trial until her sentence came out. It happened at the beginning of 2001. The version of the murder put together by the police was presented by the prosecution and accepted by Caroline, who pleaded guilty to the crime. She was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Elizabeth Barber, Rachel's mother, wrote a book called Perfect Victim, where she tells how Rachel's life was from the moment she was born until the moment Caroline was arrested. The book gave rise to the movie In Her Skin from 2009, which in some countries received the title of I Am You. Rachel's boyfriend, Manny, ended up becoming a singer and choreographer, he reached the top of the hits in Australia three times. In January 2015, after some applications made by Caroline's lawyers, she was released six years before the end of her sentence and Rachel's parents, even though still shaken, asked the population do not bother Caroline and so grant her the necessary privacy so that she could start her life again. They don't want any contact with her, but they want her to start her life in peace. 